This program is brought to you by the Merdeka Award, an initiative to promote excellence by ExxonMobil, Petronas, and Shell. Welcome to the 12th Modeca Award Roundtable, where we discuss issues and matters that are important to the development of the country. This time around, we are homing in on the creative and cultural industries, which are becoming major drivers in global economies, especially given the increasing digitization of content. Now, Malaysia's creative industry has also grown leaps and bounds over the last 10, 20 years. But do we have what it takes to be a true global player? So let's talk about that. And I'm joined by a panel of experts in different creative sectors. Let's bring them in right now. First, I have Mr. Alexander Fernandez, CEO of Streamline Media Group, a gaming and software development uh, company, which is uh, at the moment based in uh, KL, as well as uh, Las Vegas. And next, I have uh, Lau Nga Yuan, no stranger to the local art scene. She is the president of Kakisani, one of the country's most important art platforms. And next to her, we have uh, Mr. Hasnul Hadi Samsudin, director of creative multimedia division at MDEC. He has been at the forefront of developing the Malaysian creative digital content uh, through his capacity in various roles, uh, roles within the government as well as the private sector. Last but not least, next to me, I have Dato Mahide Mustakim, CEO of Creative Content Association Malaysia, which is uh, basically an association to promote and export local content to the overseas market. So basically, uh, what Dato do is to bring Malaysia's name and content to the global market. Now, that's a very interesting uh, point right there, but uh, let's start with this discussion by understanding the reality of the creative industries in Malaysia. What's your assessment at where we are right now? Are we at a good place? Let's start with Yuan. No, I think we're at a great place. I think um, with the current uh, economic uncertainty, uh, a lot more people are venturing outside of what is called the efficient market theory to look at what else can enable development, what else can be the next theory bringing forth development, bringing forth uh, regeneration of urbanization, for example, bringing forth new ideas, new thoughts, new ways to make money. And creative industry, cultural industry, is now the most talked about um, uh, uh, thing right now amongst uh, different academics, intellects, um, economics, uh, to understand how much can we harness from this um, talent pool, how much can we harness, are we doing enough to harness them? That's the question. Well, that's a great question. I mean, are we doing enough? Of course, ultimately, the plan is to be a global player, right? And where are we right now, Dato, in terms of pace? Is the ecosystem shaping up the way you want it to be? I think the government has uh, put in a lot of efforts, uh, starting with the uh, what, uh, how FINAS was formed back in 1981 to help to regulate and to develop the film industry. Film, as at that point in time, was uh, really the movies. And then uh, we come to the uh, television uh, industry and so on into the digital age where uh, the uh, Multimedia Development Corporation or MDEC was uh, formed to drive the digital content industry. Now, uh, a lot of effort, I would say, in terms of funding, in terms of uh, support, in terms of development has been put in. and. Uh, until uh, 2011, uh, where the industry working with the government uh, identified that there are two areas that really need to be uh, more, uh, to be given more support, which is more uh, to get a body to help in international marketing, because uh, and also the development of uh, human resources, which is under the creative content industry guide. Now. For the international market, what we made the study, we found that uh, we have nearly reached the maximum that the local market can absorb for the film as well as the other titles under the television program. So we have to expand, and to expand, we need to go global. That is where we were formed. When you say have reached the level, uh, the optimum level, that you, do you mean the audience? Yeah, yes. I mean the, the audience. For example, the box office uh, for about 
15 years uh, until uh, 2006, the highest uh, box office collection was 6.5 million ringgit for Sembilu. And then uh, it went up uh, about five years ago to 12 million for KL Gangster. But uh, two years ago or three years ago, yeah. we got the journey, uh, which came in about 17.3. And three months ago, with um, Police Evo, we hit 17.4. Now, that is a really high figure for, for Malaysia. But you've got to analyze and see that these are two or three films that have hit that, uh, that figure. But it shows that there is an audience. If you can get that formula right, uh, and not only focus on one uh, segment or one race uh, kind of thing. It, it, this, um, the last two films that I mentioned actually is multiracial. It attracts a lot of... Uh, so it's going to do a lot of the uh, storytelling, the con content, right? I mean, a lot of comparisons have been made uh, regionally, for example, to Malaysia, uh, sorry, to Thailand and Indonesia. But hey, you know, there's a market of 250 million, 70 million, respectively, and they mainly converse in one language. Do you see that as is that a fair assessment to compare to these countries? Well, I think on this point, I think I'll, I'll, I'll uh, segue from from what he has said. I think one of the things that from the animation side, um, uh, uh, when you see the box office, uh, is actually about relatability. Right of the content uh, to the to the consumers. Um, one a great example is Upin and Ipin, right? And uh, MDEC, you know, when, when it started off, I mean, we're, we're going to be celebrating our 20 years uh, next year, actually, 20 years of existence. But we started looking into the animation about maybe around 10 to 10 to 15 years ago, and how we developed. So, um, as of actually December 13th, uh, Les Copa, the owners of Upin and Ipin, uh, celebrated 10 years in in existence. So ten years. So UPIP has been around for almost ten years, and see, uh, look at the success that it has been. It's a success because it's it's relatable to people around the region. You know, the Indonesians really love it. That's why how they do, they're making so much success. Um, 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 although you know, th this is the probably the only uh, what for I understand from the Indonesian market is that this is the only probably Malaysian content that they want to hear it in the Malay Malay uh, Bahasa Malaysia rather than Bahasa Indonesia. So what did they get right? What is the formula? And the formula is probably uh, again, um, kampung area villages. You know, these are things that you know the people in Indonesia Malaysia could actually relate to. Um, also a bit of the um, they started out with um, a lot of the Islamic sort of content which later on became more multicultural, you know, and then adding also an Indonesian character to it. So they knew that the market wanted that. They got feedback from the market. Um, and they used tools. Um, now, you know, f people are moving away, just uh, not moving away, but also uh, using digital platforms to actually grow. So now they're looking at, you know, now the, the YouTube is probably one of the biggest platforms for them to actually monetize. Um, and actually get direct feedback, right? Where they put the content on, they get direct feedback from their consumers, the people who are watching, oh, I, you know, I, I kind of don't like this, I kind of like this. So then they can adapt to the content really quickly. So these are things that tools that people are using right now to actually look at how they can ex expand and actually create more uh, monetization possibilities. Right. What's your view on the development of the gaming sector in Malaysia? Well, I think the thing is we're at a really interesting juncture right now in Malaysia's history, just in terms of Malaysia's history in gaming right now, because there's a lot of raw talent here. I think one of the things that we talked about a little bit earlier was the fact that you're one of the places in the world that grew up with multicultural content. I mean, you have Japanese influence, Chinese influence, you have your local influence, you have the Indian influence, but then you also have the Western influence. And all of that effectively means that there is a generation of people that have grown up understanding all these various cultural uh, items that make them very dynamic in terms of what they produce in terms of content. So when we came here looking, we, we toured throughout all of uh, Asia and other parts of the world to try to find a place to come and establish our offices. Uh, Malaysia just had it because the talent is natural. It's raw. And when you see basically raw talent coming out of effectively from nowhere, you want to basically nurture that. And so what we saw and what we have seen at this moment in time is taking local natural talent, combining that with experience, uh, talent from other parts of the world, and that's where you see this explosive growth. So next year, 2016, effectively, I believe, is going to be the year for Malaysian games industry. It's going to just continue to grow as it moves forward, and really, I believe it will end up leading Southeast Asia in terms of a hub and in terms of the overall development of the industry. Well, let's talk a bit about talent, right? I mean, there has been a lot of discussion about whether our talent is on par. Your views on that, Ngayuan? Well, I think 
if given a chance, any person could be at par with whatever that is thrown or given to them. Uh, I, I think it's not that we're not able to step up to the challenge. I think it's more about how are we uh, making sure that we're developing enough talent? Are, are we doing enough through the schools? Are we trying to? Are we telling artists um, or, or students who want to creatively express themselves that hey, there is really no future for artists? But that is not what we're trying to do in schools, in education, for example. When we train someone to be creative, we don't train them to become artists naturally. That's their choice at the end of the day. But we do train them for better lateral thinking, for better um, uh, able to be innovative, and those are much needed skills today. Uh, it's really our is creative thinking even um, uh, an important matter in schools today? We talk about how STEM is a really important thing, which is uh, technology, um, uh, engineering, uh, uh, tech, math. Where is arts? So now there's a huge growth in, in conversations around it, need, arts need to be a part of this conversation All because right. otherwise you're just chasing after uh, 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 something that's maybe perhaps less soulless, which really is what drives, you know, vibes, creativity, more people wanting to do something to solve a problem, uh, bringing about new ideas, new products that is not already in the market space. All right, we're going to go for our first commercial break. When we come back, we're going to talk about talent and also creating content for the global market. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the 12 Merdeka Roundtable. We're talking about the creative and cultural industries and let's uh, dive right into the topic of talent. Alexander established that we have, have the talent, talent. we yes, have the do. pipeline. You have the talent. Do we yeah. have the ecosystem in place? The ecosystem that you want in place? Let's start with um, Haston. Okay, uh, I just want to reinforce what both of them had said early, early on before I go into the ecosystem side of it. I think one of my experiences was actually uh, part of a Rhythm and Hues, uh, which was a visual effects company that, that also landed in Malaysia. And we were involved with, um, uh, with the Oscar winning Life of Pi. And I had one individual, one of the individuals, um, his name was Albert, or one of our um, compositors. Uh, and uh, he also went through a TV interview and they were asking him, you know, um, why is it, you know, do we have the talent and, and what's the difference be between, you know, doing the world-class work that you're doing with him? He was, I think he also said that, you know, the talent is everywhere and you know, he's coming from a point of view of the talent. But the, the issue is always opportunity given and also uh, the experience. So what Rhythm and Hughes gave them, and, and I think later on, you know, if, if Alex being here also, is that it gives our talent a chance to actually show what they can produce. And at the same time, tell them, and people telling them, you can actually do a lot more, a lot better. So it just needs a little bit of guidance. So again, again this opportunity part of it is really important. And, and, it, and it only can happen if we're not so inward looking and, and looking outside also and looking at how we can actually grow uh, the talent pool within. Um, speaking about the ecosystem, I think uh, from MDEX point of view, uh, we've been working uh, with a lot of local universities to build up the digital, digital side of it. Um, we've been working directly with people like MMU, One Academy, um, um, Limcock Wing, and KDU, and these are you know, um, uh, sort of very urban university, private universities really want to be on the forefront of doing games and animation. So what, they, what we also work with them is to bring sort of expertise from around the world to actually start you know, uh, giving our students an idea of what quality means and what, what it means to, to do this kind of level of work. So um, this is the kind of exposure right now that we're giving to the ecosystem, um, but it's only specific to the animation and visual effects and game side. And we hope that the other parts of the art side will also be you know, um, um, supported. Right? But you know, we talk about ecosystem all the time, right? So the understanding of what the ecosystem really is in a creative industry, for me, really the ecosystem is everything around them. Uh, uh, whether forcefully put in place or not, th it's really less important because ultimately uh, an artist like an entrepreneur will create their own brand, their own product, their own ideas and given enough time, it will grow into something quite fantabulous and, and quite significant. Um, I, 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 I really think the, the key word or, or the thing that's really missing here is clearly exposure. 
that well you know we are we could go online we could right. look at other properties but we may not know how other people in other markets develop yeah. and we're so, always thinking and we're always you know uh, uh, not up in, in thinking that so how do we get our market to go there when you go out and you sell Malaysian content what what do you say to them? I mean, what do you say to these international broadcasters? Well, basically, uh, what we do is we identify our market, the market that uh, we have the product uh, to go to. And we are quite uh, limited or specific, which is the multimedia product at this point in time. So it doesn't uh, involve the performing arts and, and so on that Wen was uh, <laughs> saying just now. Okay. So uh, <laughs> what we do is we identify the product, we work with our industry, the producers, and uh, we then bring them. Y you will be surprised that uh, quite a number of uh, our people have got good product, but they don't really know which market is the proper yeah. uh, market to go to. Some are very developed, some are specific to film, some are specific to animation, mm -hmm. and some are specific just for TV program. If you, if you are looking for, a, and, and we don't just bring product, we also bring uh, product in development for co-production, mm -hmm. for work, for hire, that kind of uh, business. Mm -hmm. So you, you need to know. Our service to, to the industry is that we provide the uh, advice on what to go, uh, where to go, uh, when to go, and uh, we go in as a delegation. If you go in on your own, for example, I you have one title and you want to talk to a studio, it's very difficult to get the door open. But if you go in a group, for example, you've got a, a, a slate of films or a slate of TV program, you know, then it's easier for us to talk to the established uh, distributors and established uh, broadcasters. So that is where, uh, and that is what we do. So that's the, uh, the push from the policy making side, right? So I want to dive into content. Do we?